In today's rapidly changing manufacturing environment, companies and engineering professionals have to keep themselves abreast of the latest advancements in technology to maintain their competitiveness and professional competency in the shortest time possible. In such a dynamic environment, the need for real-time and forward-thinking training is crucial. To address these immediate needs, the A-STAR Singapore Institute of Manufacturing Technology or SIMTEC and SkillsFuture Singapore have come together to provide relevant technology-based training for the manufacturing industry. Singapore Institute of Manufacturing Technology or SIMTEC is a public research institute under the Agency for Science, Technology and Research or A-STAR. SimTech's mission is to develop high-value manufacturing technologies and human capital to enhance the competitiveness of Singapore industry. Through our strategic collaboration with industry partners and R&D efforts over the years, SimTech has generated in-depth knowledge and capabilities through over 300 industry projects annually. This know-how and experience allow our researchers to transfer and upgrade workforce skills aim at productivity improvement and business transformation. In partnership with the Skills Future Singapore, SimTech has been upskilling and reskilling the industry since 2008 through a wide range of industrial training programs under the Skills Framework using an innovative learn, practice and implement training model. Through more than 10 years of growth, we now train more than 1,000 professionals annually. This program helped the industry to be future-ready in today's technology workforce where digital transformation has accelerated and the key to adopting new technologies is through workforce reskilling and upskilling. Other than delivering timely case study-based curriculum, the Knowledge Transfer Office also provides hands-on practical training combined with industry best practices. Participants also have access to SimTech's state-of-the-art labs to learn about the latest technological advancement to equip themselves with new skills. For example, WSQ Operation Management Innovation Program, or Omni, which helps companies align process to company strategies and helps many companies to make significant improvement in operational productivity, efficiency, and effectiveness. The team has further developed the Digital Transformation and Innovation, or DTI, program to train and guide key personnel of organizations to be digital transformers in leveraging digital technologies to accelerate business model changes and achieve meaningful digital transformation. Using the DTI methodology, participants will learn to analyze and redesign your strategies, business model, value streams, and system architecture to ensure greater alignment, unlock new business growth, and achieve sustainable competitive advantage. As companies continue to benefit from SimTech's unique courses and manufacturing expertise, the Knowledge Transfer Office at SimTech is fast becoming recognized as Singapore's one-stop destination for manufacturing skills competency training by offering a wide range of courses and modules. The Knowledge Transfer Office helps industry in continuous education of their manufacturing professionals, managers, engineers and technicians in the manufacturing sector. By collaborating with SSG, the Knowledge Transfer Office of SimTech offers a number of SSG-certified WSQ courses, each designed to cater to the respective local industry sector. SkillsFuture Singapore is happy to partner SimTech for the last 13 years to provide industry-relevant training programs for the manufacturing sector. Through their Learn, Practice, Implement methodology, SimTech's training programs incorporate skills training, mentorship, and project implementation. These three elements, coupled with SimTech's model factory and innovation factory, come together in a synergistic way to benefit many SMEs across different industries. I'm heartened to know that SimTech is working closely with our institutes of higher learning to enable expertise transfer and to share best practices, even beyond the manufacturing sector. 
I look forward to our continued partnership with Simtech to drive skills development in advanced manufacturing and to support industry transformation in Singapore. Uh, mic check, Peter. You are yeah, good. Yes. That, yes, correct. Okay, thank, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Thank you for taking your time to attend this seminar on Applied Robotics for Manufacturing Automation. Today, we have two speakers from Simtech and ARTC to share with you on the scalable mobility platform technologies as well as Autonomous Mobile Robotics for Advanced Industrial Automation. We'll also be introducing to you a PEWSQ course that we offer to the industry under the Skill Future framework. This is to upgrade the industry on the state of the art as well as fundamentals on robotics and its application. The collaboration models between ARTC, Simtech, and the industry will also be briefed in this uh, session. Without further ado, I'll hand over to my colleague, Mr. Lim Tao Ming, to cover on the topic, Simtech Scalability Mobility Platform Technologies. Tao Ming, please. Hi, thank you, Chita. Uh, can you all hear me? Okay. Uh, I'll yes. share my screen. Okay, uh, can you see my screen? I yes okay good. okay okay uh thank you very much I shall uh, proceed on let me turn on my laser pointer okay okay good morning everybody I'm uh, Tao Ming I'm from Simtech under the uh, advanced automation division our new uh, name and also our new uh, group name which is the uh, adaptive robotics and mechatronics if you ever we asked before uh, we are formally called uh, this uh, mechatronics group. And uh, so today I'll be talking about uh, some of our work uh, that we, uh, some technologies that we contributed to our platform. So, and we term this platform the, the Scalable Mobility Platform, or in short, we call it the SMP. Okay, moving on. Okay, before I go uh, into what we've been doing, just a brief uh, overview of what we, we did before and what led us to this uh, work. So briefly, uh, we started around the year 2000, where we had uh, collaborations with local uh, and overseas universities. Namely, uh, with, uh, we work closely with NUS and overseas would be uh, uh, Stanford University. So around that time, uh, there was these uh, ongoing manpower issues which involves tasks that require this uh, skilled manual labor. And then they need to do things like uh, 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 deburring, which can generate uh, very fine, harmful uh, uh, hazardous particles. So the, this uh, also involves uh, working with uh, challenging work pieces and uh, of course the every factory, they have their own uh, tight schedules to meet. So there's also a need to actually ensure that we have a consistent co uh, quality in the work and also to minimize uh, any reworks. So from this, right, we find that actually the, there are some uh, not so good things about it is that the, the workplace is, uh, environment is actually not favorable. So it doesn't attract the uh, uh, workforce to do this task. And uh, end up is also highly dependent on skilled uh, foreign labor. And to address this, the research community had this going, ongoing interest to try to de-skill the labor. So we tried to use automation to, uh, uh, to do this task. And in, in exchange, we actually employ a general operators to operate the such machines. And maybe some of them will eventually become engineers to help to maintain the systems or to improve it. Also during the work, we also re realized that uh, being able to sense uh, contact forces is one of the important aspects. And also another one is to have a dexterous dexterity to actually uh, reach hard to reach areas. And also our focus was then was on the indoor applications. So the outcome from here was that uh, we did a mobile manipulator using this uh, very ancient uh, Puma 560 
uh, bone nucleator that was popular in the 1980s. And together with a slightly newer uh, robot, a uh, MOMAT, Tomat, the uh, model XR4000 robot, this was put together to form as a single robot to do coordinated motion. And the workpiece that was presented to us was the flexible workpiece. So there's no prior knowledge of the surface profile. And because being flexible, so when you press on one side, the other side actually it, the, the shapes uh, changes. So our task was to actually do a repair task, which was to uh, remove scratches on the surface by applying a constant polishing force on, the, on this workpiece. And notice that the workpiece itself, uh, let me play the video and notice it's not moving. Okay. The, Let me play the video. Okay, you can see the, the, the mobile manipulator, the arm and the mobile base actually moving together, trying to reach spots that uh, this end user defines where you want to do the polishing. So it has to go to hard to read places, like in this case, like the far ends of the curved surface. And then for such a hard system, it's fairly complex. There are actually many, many motors involved. Like the motor, the robot itself has uh, six motors, the base eight motors, in total 14, and you have to so be soloing at one kilohertz. So you can imagine during those days, a uh, massive amounts of wires going from both robots. And you also replace their controllers with a big uh, industrial PC with using uh, four 12-volt uh, uh, car batteries. So it's a very complex system. And uh, this was in the early days. So now the improvement today, you can see that uh, we have a much better powerful embedded PCs that is able to run uh, all real-time algorithms with great determinism. And also we have a large, large selections of motors and digital amplifiers that can have all these wonderful auto-tuning results. And you also have now uh, lithium batteries, which are much smaller. And in place of all the complex wiring, you now have a more advanced uh, things like a few buses, like your uh, device net, profit net, whatever, and also your uh, EtherCAT, which we are using. And also with the event advances in the sensors, we have a very compact uh, LIDAR, like Hokuyu, and also now uh, the RGBD sensors from Intel, real sense. On the software aspects, we also have uh, uh, contributions from uh, Linux with uh, platforms like uh, this uh, robot, robot operating system, ROS, or in Windows. We also have our very nice uh, development studios like Visual Studio with all the famous, all the popular languages. And also now even your PLCs have also shifted to PC-based. For example, things like your TwinCat from Backoff. Besides that, we also have uh, advances in your cloud connectivity. So you have, a, you have your solutions from Azure, from uh, Amazon, from cloud, from this uh, Google also, and also all the I IoT uh, stuff. Then the community also has contributed much to the use of GitHub. So these are now very exciting times. So when we start out, we were towards the end of this uh, industry 3.0. Now we are moving towards 4.0. And then uh, with, uh, around the, when we were doing it, there was uh, also great interest in this automation. And also uh, foreign labors were being kept. So to us, the lower sending fruit was actually the mobility part of our earlier work. So the, we realized that the material transfer is a very common task. If you look at the eight-inch facts today, uh, there are still quite a bit of uh, manual transfer from the different tools. And then also the available AGV dams were actually very expensive and they were not very flexible because most probably they are actually guided. So it means they actually need to follow some tapes or magnetic starts or maybe some uh, effective picks on the, on the wall. So when we move forward towards to the new era, we feel that actually the, there will be continue, continuous use of this uh, automation, but now the focus will be on exchange of data and, and encompassing technologies like the IoT and cloud computing, and also the artificial intelligence. So with that, we also try to uh, do our work and also try to make tighter integration between our hardware and software solutions. So for us, we also look into uh, how can we uh, address the needs of the enterprise, which are housed in the intranet uh, environment, maybe due to their security uh, uh, preference. And also for entities that prefer they are open to a cloud-based uh, hosting on external servers. We also look into possible solutions with that. Maybe they need to do, use that to offload their computation needs also. So on the local side of things, we also look into the possibility of uh, looking into app applications for things like maybe using it as a, uh, maybe a touch, a touch pendant and such, and also for the local interfacing to your sensors and also to your different actuations. In this case, our view modules. And finally, we also have interface to the various toolbox that are used for the fleet management, 
localization and map building, or even our omnidirectional navigation purposes. So this is roughly the overview of our platform. So very traditionally, you see that uh, your view platforms you have uh, configured for like two view modules like your sideways or your tricycle in the three view version, or um, uh, even the very commonly used uh, Ackerman drives, which uh, you see commonly in four view vehicles like your cars and such. So one thing you notice about all these implementation is that they cannot do this uh, sideway motion without having without uh, the use of slipping their wheels. So for us, we have this particular interest to address this. So the in, so we, we find that uh, we having this omnidirectional motion is something that, that is possible to address some of these uh, earlier uh, implementations. So with uh, omnidirectional motion, what we can do is that we can do simultaneous uh, independent rotation and translation motion. And also we are able to handle tight corners with zero radius turning while maintaining a predefined uh, orientation. So you can see on the right side, the two uh, illustrations. We have one where the robot needs to move in a tight uh, sort of a Z path for maintaining its orientation of the payload. So if you were to do this in a traditional differential view of a uh, way, most only when you do a turning, you have, it's similar like your car, you have to do a turn. And uh, for tight confined spaces, the, there's a possibility of collision. So the planning is a bit challenging. Okay, so with this uh, high maneuverability, it makes uh, omnidirectional motion uh, quite suitable for obstacle avoidance or in cases like right, you need to maintain the direction of heading or in case of a docking, we need to interface with some other mechanical parts. And uh, also because of its omnidirectional nature, it makes the path planning uh, much more simple. So you can imagine if I want to do the traditional uh, differential wheel system to move to the right, maybe as a car, you have to actually go back and forth all the way just to move to the right side, whereas the opposite direction will just shift to the right. Okay. So what is so, what is the unique feature of all these uh, different omnidirectional platforms that we see? Actually, we, we realize that the, the common difference is that it's in the view module design itself. You can see from the left side, these are very common uh, non-conventional views. So what you see is the omnidirectional view and things like your mechanical view. On the right side, you have the different solutions that use conventional views. So these are typical views that you can find off the shelf. And uh, because they're really livable, they are able to meet the different industry needs. Like for example, you have views that are food grade compatible, wheels that are clean wheel compatible and such. Another thing to note is that a wheel is a consumable item. So means after a wheel, uh, after some time of use, the wheel and tire needs to be replaced. So from our point of view, we feel that uh, using conventional wheels is a better approach to, to meet the needs of uh, many people, many industries. So with that in mind, we came up with our, uh, this uh, what we call the decoupled wheel design. So uh, as expected, it allows omnidirectional if you use two or more units of it. And it uh, provides uh, independent steer and roll directions. You can see in the picture here now, it's doing a continuous uh, rolling. And then uh, this is of un unlimited range. So you also can do a steer, which is to rotate the wheel around here, also unlimited range. And all this is possible while the two motors are still not moving. They do not carry each other. They're all stationary. And this one uses uh, our, our initial uh, design. We actually use uh, off the shelf, 100 mm wheels. It's a faster design. So the overall design also, this, we also went through some improvements. So we actually lowered the overall uh, profile height. And now it's uh, totally get driven. So, what, so uh, besides what I mentioned about this, uh, the, all the uh, possible solutions, um, possible ways you can use it for this uh, omni uh, capability, which is like omnidirectional of the shelf and such. We also did some other works to make it a more complete solution. So another part is that you need to have this, uh, the map itself. So this was done through the simultaneous localization and map building. So I, mean, I think it's quite popular, quite slim. So usually what happens is that this is done once in a new environment. So you get a new map. So if we have, we have two possible routes of doing this, you can do it through the ROS way using the open source codes and you can do this a real time uh, map generation or you can have our own internal development which is using Windows for offline approach. So besides getting the map, you also know, in, know that you need to do the navigation. So things like your point to point with uh, VR points or your obstacle detection or maybe even avoidance and whether you can run in the omni or differential mode. So omnidirectional motion is actually able to do a uh, sort of uh, scale down back to a differential motion. So similar for navigation, we have it in the, uh, in the Linux or in the ROS and the Windows environment. 
So there are also add-on applications like docking. So docking will be useful for features that you need to do the auto charging or, machine, or con, uh, interfacing to machine to machine. So you can see on the right side, we have uh, one simple application to do docking in our model factory. So the mobile robot, which is the black portion at the bottom, is now carrying a conveyor system. So that's the challenge is that it needs to align the two conveyors, the one on the robot and the one on the machine side, such that it is within a very tight tolerance of, I think, about plus minus two mm and maybe within the one, de one two degrees. So if, if you do not meet this requirement, right, the part that is transferred will be jammed at the interface. So you can see on the left side, it's doing a, a cost uh, alignment, uh, docking alignment. On the right side, it's doing a very fine adjustment. If you can see the small motion that's required. Of course, uh, to interface with the robot, we also have our external interfaces for, for the enterprise to actually uh, input their, in the scheduler to send their commands. Moving on. So this is uh, roughly how the view, look like, uh, view looks like close up on the ground. So like any uh, typical cluster wheel, uh, it has a central uh, steer where the wheel is mounted at the offset. And then there's a point contact at the bottom between the wheel and the ground. So on the right side, you see is our sort of a schematic view of how we usually draw the, this view setup. So on the left bottom is you see the actual uh, physical hardware itself, this is how it looks like. So what happens is that when we do our configuration, we have a software to help you to uh, sort of identify where you like to place your views, and then also the parameters that will be used for the controller to control the views. So on the left side, you see one that's done for uh, two view configuration. On the right side, you see the top one that's one done for three view configuration, and also the bottom is a four view configuration. So you, of course you can do five and more also. So we just do uh, show you three here. So the setup allows you to actually configure how you place the wheels, whether it's a standalone robot, or maybe the robot needs to wrap around some uh, equipment to be moved and such. So with the configuration done nicely, you can actually uh, do some uh, simple simulation to test the kinematics, see how the wheels actually react when you move to the right, move to the top, move up, or do a rotation. So once you're happy with the, 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 how the setup is, then the, this set of parameters will be downloaded to the motion controller. Okay. So this is uh, uh, the one big picture you see on the right is uh, the, roughly the, the setup that we have for our model factory setup. So this is using two view modules, also in another configuration. This time they are both pointing down by the angle. And uh, this, uh, all we have here is actually powered by off a Windows-based uh, CPU. In this case, you got it from back off. Why do you get back off? Because the back off itself also has this portion that does the PLC. So we can get the PLC portion of back off to work with the back off part that is communicating the robot. So they work as one unit in the controller. And also the same thing happens for the, when it comes to the, if you do the Windows-based option, we can also do the, uh, the, the, the navigation part also on the same back off controller. So it may not be back off as long as it is a, a network interface that is compatible with the Ethercat standard. So we also have, uh, in this particular setup, we are using a DC uh, servo motors uh, with uh, 3,000 RPM at 0.8 Newton meter. So we have tested versions from uh, Maxon and from Moon. So as long as the motor size, the diameter is of uh, 60 mm, uh, it should be able to fit with the, this uh, patented uh, this uh, gearbox that we have. And uh, our focus, uh, actually, we were using mainly this uh, Ethercat standard because I find that is the one of the more uh, the preferred uh, interface. So an, an example of another example of this hardware setup is that uh, you, you see on the right here, uh, what you see before was the robot uh, carrying the payload. This is another one where the robot is towing the payload. So for us, typically what happens is that for the wheel modules, we target each wheel module to carry a payload of about 100 kg. So in this case, when it's a two wheel module configuration, it should be able to carry a 200 kg. Acceleration is at uh, one meter per second squared and maximum speed is one meter per second. So like in this application, you see that the robot actually has a uh, two active wheel module. So it's able to do omnidirectional motion. But in the case of when you do a towing, you actually you need to tow in one direction. You cannot go any uh, other directions. Yeah, it has to be the direction of the, the motion. And then for this particular application, we are using a uh, same 100 mm wheels. So we have actually tested with a system that has more than 100 mm wheels. So we have tested with 125, 150 wheels also. And uh, also it's using the 60 mm motors. This current one is configured with a 400 watt version. 
And the system, because of the lower gear ratios, it is spec drivable. So in cases like due to safety, maybe the robot has a has some uh, maybe uh, uh, push somehow has uh, someone trapped in the corner. The person is actually able to push it away. Okay. So with this, uh, we actually did some testing to gather some of the results. This shows that uh, we are able to achieve uh, the on right the right most picture. You can see that it has reached this uh, one meter per second uh, uh, rate of speed that we put in. And on the right side, you can see in the middle, it has actually gone past the one meter per second uh, squared uh, acceleration. If it follows a uh, 0.5 uh, meter this uh, velocity requirement. So on the software aspects, also uh, we we also did quite a bit work on that area. So for us, uh, our controller setup is actually comprises of the three levels. So the low level one will actually uh, take care of the motion required uh, algorithms. So this one has to be a deterministic because it's going to do things like your kinematics, your trajectory planning, your motion control. And then for this part, right, uh, we're lucky that there's, uh, we, for, for, because we are doing it in the Windows environment. So we need Windows by itself is uh, not a real-time uh, uh, program. So we need to modify the kernel to, uh, to be able to have a real-time development environment for us to do our work. So for us, we leverage on this uh, capability uh, from this company called Interval Zero, and also their, their, their sub product uh, from Kingstar, which actually provides this uh, Ethercat, real time Ethercat master stack for us to interface with the, our Moto drivers. So, looking at the next higher level, so uh, this one could be in a Windows based system, or it could be a Linux based, uh, which we run off the robot operating system. So, from the right, you can see the top uh, is actually the the same, I mean, the, the one that we use if it's a, uh, it's a window based application. So, the, what we provide is a DLL control to give you the left side GUI, and the right side is your typical individual, uh, I mean, in the, uh, individual applications design of the GUI. And then at the back, of course, there'll be a few more uh, libraries to actually do the interfacing to the real time part and to the enterprise part. So, on the bottom side, you see is the implementation, but this time it's in the uh, ROS environment. And uh, where the left side you see is doing the, the real-time uh, map generation. The right side is an example of another interface by this time in Linux. And at the higher level, we also need to interface with these uh, fleet management. So uh, each robot will have its own web services that can provide uh, the external parties to actually interface through the APIs to control how you want to move the robot and also to set the robot parameters. Okay, so uh, coming to my last slide. So it's more, now we are talking about the highest level of our software implementation, which is the fleet management. So roughly the architecture is quite simple. Each robot will have its own uh, web server on board. For the Windows application, we'll be using the IIS that is provided from uh, Microsoft. So you run this, so you'll be able to run the web services to provide things like to give the VR points of the robot or to maybe to, to decide how to, uh, do the some other uh, like trajectory parameters and also to get the status feedback. Okay, then of course the you we, for our model factory implementation, ours was the motion controller was done by the the windows, but it was interfaced with a uh, NUC uh, PC from uh, Intel that is running off. So it's a uh, running from running the ROS. So this uh, this back off and this uh, Linux based. Uh, uh, NUC PC will be housed in each robot. Okay, and then on the other end, we have the server side, which is doing the fleet management. So what happens is that the end user will, with the fleet management, will not have direct access to the robot. Rather, they submit their request to the fleet management, which has the overview of the uh, fleet status. So it's able to uh, know the resources available, what's the schedule like, what's the proximity between the robot and the uh, pick up or drop off points and also their task priority. And you automatically uh, uh, select the most uh, appropriate uh, robot and submit the task for you to do. So the, that's a difference. So the user, if, if they bypass the fleet management means they can directly access the robot and do the motion. If they want to have some entity to help to manage the fleet of robots, then they have to go through the fleet management, which will decide uh, the, which is the best uh, robot to actually to, to take off the job. 
so simply this sleep management can be implemented in two ways. So you can have the Windows option also, or you can do it the Linux way. So Linux will be uh, using more of whatever is available in the open source, but that's the Windows one because uh, there's this isn't much of this available. So all these are developed uh, within our institute. So I've come to the end of the presentation of uh, what we have done for our scalable mobility platform with all the different pieces of technology that uh, we can work together to actually implement it for the different applications. Yeah, so I come to the end of my presentation. Uh, I shall hand back to Chita. Uh, or Peter. Hello. Huh? Okay, now next speaker from ARTC, do you want to share our screen and take over the presentation? Yeah, our next speaker will be uh, uh, okay. Kwame Yuan uh, from uh, yes. ARTC. Okay, can I share please? my screen? Yeah, please just share, okay. Uh, can you see screen? Yes. Hello. Oh. Yes. Okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Guan Ming Yang from ARA Group. Uh, also, we call it Advanced Robot Arctic Applications in ARTC. In our group, uh, our uh, development focus is on the robotic systems for um, industrial manufacturing. Today, I share autonomous mobile robot uh, for advanced industrial applications. And for the past decades, uh, the industrial manufacturer has gone through several stages, um, from totally manual controlled to automated guide vehicles, and now reached to this stage, uh, autonomous mobile robot dominated stage. So the, so the difference among this three can be summarized from these four aspects, uh, such as an application method, uh, deployment of op, uh, operational flexibility, responsiveness, uh, and uh, generally at stage one, we can see all the devices, uh, such as vehicles, are operated by human. So the flexibility of operation and uh, uh, environmental reconfiguration is very high, while the drawbacks is, uh, is it requires plenty of human labor. The stage two, we have achieved partial automation uh, for the uh, industrial manufacturing, uh, such as part of the vehicles are operated autonomously, while uh, at this stage, it requires some additional infrastructure works. So this is not uh, uh, this will require um, a lot of maintain cost uh, if we want to change the environment. And uh, now we reach the stage two. The stage two aims to reduce the dependency uh, and infrastructure construction while also enable autonomous operation. Uh, from this figure, uh, we can see that stage two, uh, three is aimed to uh, achieve the same flexibility with stage one, uh, but uh, uh, also reduce the human labor. Uh, the difference between HGV and uh, ARV can be summarized uh, in these uh, few items. Uh, the most uh, important difference among them is that uh, HGV requires the tracks such as the magnetic, uh, magnetic tape, visual tracker. Uh, this, uh, these sensors, these external sensors will predefined the path for HGV, such as the path like this. So the HGV can only navigate itself in the environment by following the predefined path. Once there has some obstacles stand between uh, or on the predefined path, what the HGV can do is only stop itself and wait. <clears throat> so this introduces a problem that if we want to modify the existing path or, uh, or, or expand uh, uh, the existing path, we need some infrastructure work. So this will introduce the additional cost for the maintenance of the workplace. While the AMR don't have such limitations. And 
since the AMR will use the surfacetic sensors installed on the, uh, on, on the platform, such as uh, LiDAR and camera, with these sensors, the AMR can percept, can percept the surrounding environment, and also the AMR can locate itself within the workplace. So also the information collected from the sensors and the sound algorithms, the AMR can find uh, an optimal path and also collision-free path to navigate itself around uh, the human and the code. So the obstacle, uh, so that means the AMR can bypass, have the ability to bypass the obstacle code. Uh, so the path in the environment will not be fixed. In, in this case, uh, if we want to expand or modify the path for AMR, uh, we have uh, we don't need to know uh, we need no infrastructure changes for the environment. This is a big advantage for the AMR. Uh, currently, AMR has plenty of applications in industry. Uh, they are mainly used in logistics and warehouse, um, military and defense, uh, healthcare, and um, manufacturing and uh, mining. <clears throat> uh, meanwhile, more and more other potential applications are found in the market. Uh, such as here, we can see still has a lot of market uh, for, uh, for the application of AMR need to be found. In nowadays, uh, we can find some popular AMRs in, in the market, such as good two-person picking robots, self-driving forklifts, autonomous inventory robots, and also among the aerial uh, vehicles. The most popular one, I think most of uh, them know, is a DJI right now. And also AMR has some popular applications such as sorting packages, pick and place goods, token, warehouse fleet management. <clears throat> However, uh, the AMR has, uh, there are some challenges when we deploy AMR into industrial. Uh, we summarize the, the, the exist challenging from these four aspects. First uh, uh, is the employee skill set. Currently, um, we lack of, uh, um, we lack of the person that have the uh, proper robotic experience. So we need to train more, uh, more employees to suit for new technology. And also the company also need to hire uh, more people that have the pro proper robotic experience. And uh, second is the safety measurement. Since AMR will introduce new safety hazard. So, uh, we, so we must define the safety standards uh, and enable AMR to obey them. In this case, uh, the AMR can ensure the safety for the workers uh, that, that, who are working in a synth workspace with AMRs. And the third um, challenge is how to manage, in, uh, how to manage product workflow, uh, such as how to determine, uh, determine the change and product uh, workflows to ensure the maximum productive after we uh, implementation the AMR into the workplace. The last one we summarized as the technology gaps, uh, su such as uh, how to manage multiple robots uh, and uh, enable them work harmony, um, in, in work harmony in a same workspace and also how to cooperate uh, AMR with other devices uh, uh, to enable the robot to carry out even more complex tasks. Uh, also how to apply vision technologies to enhance the intelligence for mobile robots. So those challenges are our focus and aim to solve them in our research. Uh, in ARTC ARA group, um, our technology development focus on uh, these three aspects. Uh, firstly, is a platform robotic software, such as uh, auto tool path generation, 2D, 3D, machine based uh, object detection, and uh, post estimation, UGV, uh, UA, uh, UAV, UGV, uh, AGV, cooperated fl uh, fleets. The second field is robotic, uh, robotic uh, applications. Uh, such as surface fishing, uh, assembling, machine tending, painting, 
and uh, AGV mobile manipulator, manipulator product handling. The last one is robotic factory automation, such as sh uh, shop floor layout design, process floor design, uh, design system requirement, and uh, specialized uh, specifications. Here, um, for example, we have developed a, a, co a complete uh, nest road planning for heterogeneous robot fleet. The motivation for this development is that, uh, personally, uh, since uh, different AMR platform might have to work and share the same environment. So each vehicle uh, will decide its own route to execute the given task. Uh, therefore, the dead, uh, deadlocks are a common issue when much robot compete for a real, uh, real uh, resource, such as a natural corridor. The second is we also need, uh, need uh, that individual vehicles uh, uh, need to be optimized, considering task priority, um, pass lane, battery life, and safety. Finally, uh, a fleet management software also be, need to be developed to communicate uh, between AMR and the production management software such as WMS or e MES. Our solution is not summarized in this figure from uh, uh, for each type of AMR platform, we need to develop a fleet management to build the connection between AMR and the traffic manager. Then uh, once, once the traffic manager receives uh, all the information from AMR, then, uh, we are, uh, and then it will solve the potential conflict and uh, provide a condition-free solution for AMR. Uh, Summarizing the uh, algorithm is implemented from uh, three steps. First, uh, uh, each robot is given a certain goal. Then uh, a path planning module will be used to calculate the option optimal route for uh, to go for each robot. Finally, <clears throat> the step three is to solve the conflict by identifying the potential conflicts, such as if two uh, robots, if two robots attend, uh, attempt to reach a same load at a very close time stamp, then we mark them uh, as the conflict potential for this case. We, we solve the conflict by adding waiting time uh, and the robot with now priority. Here, uh, I play the video. Oh, sorry, uh, seems the video cannot play. Okay, uh, so we go to next step. Uh, next step. Oh, video play. Um, from, uh, this video gave the demonstration on four different uh, AMRs, one feature and two MR, MIR and one Husky. So each robot has a different destination goal. Well, uh, when they reach to their goal, uh, some of them might conflict with each other. So our algorithm is to uh, find a way to uh, enable this robot to uh, go to the given destination safely and conflict free. Here we, we go to another project in, in our ARA group, uh, mo mobile manipulator. The motivation for this development is uh, that uh, the, since the market of mobile manipulation continue growing, uh, and uh, we, ha we have limited choice for all in one solution for industrial applications. And here we list some existing platforms that integrate mobile uh, base and uh, manipulator in one platform. And after we, uh, once we cooperate uh, between mobile robot base and the manipulator, the robot can carry out uh, even more complex tasks, such as grabbing the uh, given object and uh, transfer it to uh, another place. However, how to a given object using manipulator is not an easy task. The robot needs to percept the environment and identify the given object uh, using some sophisticated sensors such as camera or LiDAR 
and uh, algorithms such as um, uh, deep learning modules to identify, to detect and classify the objects. This is, this is a, a flow chart of the developed mobile manipulator system and the application GUI is to receive the command from the operator, such as indicating which object to pick. <clears throat> then the developed uh, beam picking vision, uh, vision system will be, used, uh, will be used to identify and locate uh, the indicated object such as this. They will cl uh, classify the, the object based on and the vision image and then select the one which is indicated by the operators. After this, uh, a collision free motion planning will be used to find, uh, find a path for the manipulator. Uh, and so in this case, the manipulator uh, can navigate its gripper uh, to the, uh, to the uh, destination and position of the uh, object and then graph it. After, uh, after that, the navigation system will control the <coughs> The navigation system will control the mobile, uh, mobile base, this one, to navigate the robot to the given destination. Meanwhile, to facilitate the development for mobile manipulation system in this project, we have developed a workflow and a modular programming interface to ease of programming and the control of mobile manipulator. In ARTC, currently we have plenty, uh, plenty of AMR platform. We can see this platform are, are the one we have in, in our group, <clears throat> such as the Husky, uh, Omrom, uh, MIR, Fitch, KUKA, and Sisto. With, the, uh, with this platform, we, uh, they can be used to achieve various kind of tasks, and uh, we can test uh, various um, um, AMR-based uh, applications for industrial manu uh, manufacturing. Um, more importantly, uh, we, have uh, implement, uh, we have implemented the ground truth systems in our test environment. Uh, here we have two ground truth, uh, ground truth systems. One is OptiTrack motion tracking, which can achieve sub-millimeters uh, accuracy Macro tracking, so this is a very accurate uh, tracking system. And second, uh, in marble mind uh, indoor localization, this uh, system is based on ultra sort based uh, bacon tracking. And uh, it, it can also achieve uh, about two centimeters uh, tracking accuracy. With this ground truth system, we, we can test and verify the developed uh, robotic systems before we uh, implement uh, this system into the industry. Uh, finally, uh, finally, I will briefly introduce uh, our, our upcoming course. Uh, it's called the Deployment of Autonomous Mobile Robot in Industrial Manufacturing. This course uh, is target launched at September and or October. The course objective for, uh, is to uh, let the participants learn the fundamental technology behind AMR also and help them understand the existing and the potential application of AMR. Finally, also help them prepare to work with new robotic technologies. Uh, this course is targeted on whoever plans or have the ambition to use AMR or ATV to improve their productive or enhance the shop flow activities. Um, the course uh, will, uh, will be carried out from uh, three different sessions. Uh, first is a classroom lecture. During this time, um, we will introduce the fundamental technology behind the, the autonomous mobile robot. A second session is a case study and the discussion. We will uh, help the um, participants uh, to review the advanced applications for MR. Finally, is a practice learning. Uh, during this session, we will, hand, uh, we will prepare hand-on training on one applications in our robot arena environment. Uh, this will be taken, uh, which will uh, let the participant to have the opportunity to get close to the autonomous mobile robots, such as how to operate them and enable the robot autonomous navigation in the autonomous navigated in the environment. 
uh, that's all my uh, presentation. Uh, thank you. Can I uh, put it back to Chita? Hello. Hi, everyone. Our next speaker will be uh, uh, James Yip. James is our senior industry manager from Simtech. He will present it to you uh, on the collaborative industry projects framework and also the course information. Okay, James, please. Hi, good morning. I think it's definitely good to see many of you over here. Uh, thanks for coming. Okay, what I will be sharing with you will be, uh, trust me, will be less than five minutes. It will be very short so that we can give more time for the Q&A session at the later part. So to begin with, actually, um, yeah, actually I'm back to SimTech now, handling the robotics and uh, automation section supporting SimTech as well as ARTC. So as we understand, the government actually has been very focused uh, on bringing up the manufacturing sector to improve the GDP. If I'm not mistaken, it's 20%. Uh, I think it's in the paper, you correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, so actually in the manufacturing area to focus, I think to do automations, definitely robotic is one of the options that, that I believe many can choose from. So let me just share with you, without further ado, let me just share with you what would be the next, right? So actually in um, robotics or A AMR, so we have this called uh, PEITM, called Precision Engineering, uh, Industrial Transformation Mapping, that we focus on the area of growth. It's basically that this robotics automation could be applied on area like semiconductors environments, test and measurements uh, area, additive manufacturing, of course, robotics is one of it. As well as, if you notice that we also involve components level like sensors, laser optics, and advanced materials. So to enhance the use of the autonomous robotics. So I think one of uh, uh, the audience or school attendees have asked about, you know, for, 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 for the, is it very difficult if there's a dustbin around the AI? I think if I'm not mistaken, I think we could use sensor to, 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 to address this problem. But technically, I will leave it to the technical expert, our scientists, to better answer you these questions. But I, my guess, it should be using part of it. Right, the next one, you will notice that why we are showing this triangle, actually. So in terms of ASTAR, we are handling technology providers. And we work very closely with demand drivers as well as system integrator. When we talk about demand driver, basically, we are use, working with the end user, people like the manufacturers, logistic house, FMBs, I'm sure we are. FMB also needs to do automation in terms of uh, cooking their food and stuff like that. I believe that is a good area to grow into, and of course security. So, as for system indicators, because SimTech or even ARTC, we may not be the expert in indicating our technology with the end user. That's where we need system indicators to play a part to do a better integration, so that it can really plug and play. So this is where the triangle come from. So uh, as I say, if you have noticed what I have typed earlier on, if you have uh, any uh, autonomous mobile robotics uh, sections or area which you want to imply or into your production line, just feel free to contact me. We definitely can have a one-to-one -one private discussions and to better understand your requirements. So next will be I will be sharing a bit on our, our courses basically, because many a time I believe that uh, some of you may have uh, employees who may not be very well versed, or even for those employees, you feel that they could have a good comprehensive understanding of robotics and automation. So actually Simtech has come up with these courses whereby we can help to give a certain depth of knowledge in this area, which could help your employees to understand better or to so-called to appreciate Automations robotics arena. So our courses actually, if you if you have a look at it, we cover pretty uh, uh, in depth, adequate enough for for people to appreciate the applications of robotics and automations. Okay, and uh, furthermore, the cost fees, as you understood, that it will be as this course is run also by also fund by Skill Future Singapore. So the cost fees is pretty low, up to 70% cost fees, uh, so-called subsidiary for MNCs 
and for Singaporeans of certain age, we go up to as high as 90% of subsidy. So even if you are an individual person, you can use your skill future credit to pay for it at a very low price. I believe this, this, this 90% will also apply to you if you are a Singaporean or PR at a certain, uh, sorry, I think Singaporeans, yeah, and to a certain age above 40. Right, if you have further questions, as I, you can always contact me or my counterpart, Dr. Ling Wei. Uh, without further ado, thanks for your time and thanks for coming. Peter, can I hand this back to you? Thank you. Okay, thank you, James. Okay, hi everyone. So the next we will come to the session of Q and A. Uh, let's check the Q and A box. Huh? Okay, the first question. Uh, all the panelists, are you able to open the Q and A uh, box? Uh, yes, yes. Okay, first see. question is I want to ask for the OS for the robot. Which one is more robust? Use Windows or use uh, Linux? Uh, Tommy okay. or? Or oh, maybe I start first. Okay, sure. Okay, uh, so from my point of view, I think the your the platform that you want to choose actually depends a lot on your within your company itself. Do you have the people who are versed in the either platforms? Uh, let's say if your company is, is like predominantly Windows based and you you want to branch into this uh, Linux uh, world, then of course you need to get your people trained in this uh, new environment. So then then there's this uh. It, so this is the thing that whether the, the company as a whole is able to, is 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 uh, willing to sort of uh, support this uh, the development. If not, then of course the if if there's if no, then you the or maybe due to the uh, company policies or ITSS requires it to be Windows based, then maybe this is one approach. Uh. But I, I don't see nowadays this one is a big issue because uh, I think companies now are getting quite a. Uh, 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 sort of uh, adventurous in going to the different platforms available. Then also another thing is to note too is also that the other software that you need to work to work together with in your uh, system. So it happened that you you are using uh, additional software or hardware that is only available in the Windows platform. Then of course it's easier to do it in the Windows space. But uh, as mentioned, also now more companies are actually also adopting uh, solutions for Linux. So. It has to depend on the what what is it that you want to integrate together and also whether if it's possible to do it together yeah then also uh, i think is to add is that uh, of course uh, this linux is a uh, more of a open source based uh, platform so uh if uh, if uh, the company is okay with this approach then i guess it's not, not much of an issue yeah so coming uh, Ming yang anything else to add? okay Okay, Kuan, Kuan Yang, you want to answer the next question? What is okay. the maximum payload capacity to of the AMRs that the ARTC has developed? Uh, the maximum payload uh, we currently not, uh, I didn't measure this before, as but uh, in the uh, market, uh, the maximum payment payment for AMR uh, usually can reach current can reach is such as one point two two ton. So this is, um, we can find uh, some popular products uh, in markets. Uh, so this uh, should be a lot of problem. But in, in ARTC, uh, our robot maybe can uh, have the payload of 500 kg. But in, in the near future, if we wish to increase the payment payload, we can um, in, uh, apply some different uh, AMR platform. And uh, for the next uh, question, uh, I think uh, we don't need to remap uh, for a small change on the shop, shop, uh, shop floor, since the localization algorithm usually can tolerate uh, a certain degree of the change in the environment. So if uh, just uh, only a, sm a sm very small region changed in the uh, old, uh, old environment, we don't need to remap. However, if the environment have a very big changes, such as uh, uh, when you map for the environment, uh, your warehouse is empty. Well, uh, you put some uh, put some package in in this warehouse, then and later the, the warehouse is full. So th th this map totally need to change again, since the uh, AMR cannot uh, localize itself in this great uh, tunnel so great uh, changes in this environment. Okay, so Mia, uh, you have answered the question from this uh, Chu Chu Yin Chu, huh? Uh, okay. 
Yeah, next. Okay, you. So next, uh, uh, next question is what's uh, what's the acceptable degree of change in environment allowed for AMR robot? Do I need to have AMR provider engineer to come every time to perform mapping if ma mapping not match? And if the mapping not match, and so that means your environment have a big change. Then in this case, uh, you you need to remap again. Uh, and this question is very similar to previous question. So if uh, only a very small region of the environment changed, uh, so you don't need to uh, you don't need to remap. So this is based on the uh, based on uh, if your localization algorithm can can work properly. If it cannot work properly, then then that means your environment has changed bigger. So you need to remap again. Okay. Yeah, maybe I can, I can also add one more thing is that uh, besides okay. using just purely LiDAR, you can actually include other sensors to help you with this uh, in these uh, difficult situations. Let's say for maybe if, if mm. worse come to worse, you can even include some maybe reflective uh, sensor so that you know it can help you to do the localization in cases whereby there are big uh, sort of uh, uncertainties inside certain regions. Yeah. Mm. Okay, so... The next okay. session, okay. Uh, Peter, can you run the poll, please? Oh, okay. Okay. At the same time, we have a poll. Uh, okay, while we are have a Q and A, you can have a poll. Same time, we carry on for the Q and A, la. Uh, so the next question will be how AMR root map will evolve to adopt the 5G tech. So what the, the Tommy yep. or uh, Ming, Ming Yang can... Maybe I can give a bit uh, of uh, my personal view on this 5G thing, because uh, I, I have a brief uh, uh, sort of a little bit of uh, encounter with a 5G. Uh, so my, my view is actually quite limited. Uh. From what I understand is there are two parts to it. One is the 5G that is the, the approved, what do you call it, the frequency that you can use. So 5G in the sense of using it as, a, as using the wave, the, the, the sort of the spectrum, right? One of them is like to use this uh, MM wave as a replacement for the typical uh, LIDAR way of doing things. So that one is, uh, I think now it's getting out quite hot in this uh, autonomous vehicle where they use this uh, MM wave uh, to actually sense through the rain and maybe even detect like glass or such things. So it, it may be one possible way, but the thing is, I think the the resolution is not as good as the typical LiDAR. So uh, it, it may improve over time. So that one, uh, we have to see what exciting technologies come out from it. Another thing is on the use it, using it as a means of communication. Uh, I think that from what I understand is this uh, 5G has to be tagged to some telco. In this case, maybe like, for example, Singtel. So all the devices that need to communicate with this uh, to another person using 5G, right? They somehow have to be have some subscription with some telco and such. But you also have the possibility of a uh, sort of like let's say if this particular system is not able to link to the to the network, but another it, but it can relay through another one which has a connection. So I I roughly sort of got some of these ideas of this. Uh, I mean, from, from interaction and uh, what I see on the internet. Uh. So I guess uh, these are some things that actually help, may help to address areas of like blind spots within the factory and such. So I believe uh, at some point in time, there'll be a sort of a hybrid between this uh, high or whatever we have now and also with 5G. But I, I believe it will come into the picture one way or another. Yeah. Uh, yes. Thank you, Don Ming. Yeah. Uh, is uh, Ming Yang have any comments on this? Uh? Uh, I think also since 5G has a, a good payload for the data trans uh, transmission, uh, uh, and in the in the future, uh, uh, the warehouse cannot only be uh, exist one AMR. There there usually be plenty of uh, plenty amount of AMRs work together in the same environment. So 5G can definitely will provide. Uh, a good method for the data communication between the AMR and the uh, tra uh, traffic management system. And also uh, the AMR itself can in uh, interface or in, 
uh, interface with its nearby AMR. So in, in this case, um, the system for the currently such as central uh, central uh, control based uh, uh, and uh, uh, change the central based control system to such a distributed central uh, distributed uh, control system such a, uh, such that the AMR can use its local information with a certain range uh, certain radios uh, of, uh, of of AMRs. So in this case, the five uh, G since five G can provide the uh, efficient data. Uh, transparent technologies, so MR information ex uh, exchange will be much easier. Okay, thank you, Guan Yuan. Okay, next question. What simulation modeling platform AMR use to simulate a safe navigation path? Uh, for simulation of AMR, we usually use the gazebo. In this environment, uh, we uh, it will provide uh, the sensors like uh, uh, RGB, uh, RGBD, RGBD cameras in, uh, images, and also the LiDAR uh, sensors. So uh, if we want to um, carry out the AMR into the, uh, the physical environment, we can simulate uh, it in, in a gazebo simulation environment. Uh, this uh, in, uh, simulation environment can provide accurate uh, simulation uh, uh, can provide a very close to the physical environment uh, simulation. Okay, any further comments from the panelists? Uh, nothing, uh, not for me. Okay. Okay, okay. okay. if they can make a question, uh, I think this would be uh, Ming Yang also. Uh, how do you compare AMR in ARTC to any existing industrial MMRs such as MIR, Omron, et cetera, what are the aspects we needed to consider if we want to choose one of the MR brands and apply it in the production line? Mm, for uh, this question, um, so the existing MR, they, they may have some difference in their uh, in, in, their, uh, in their sensors and uh, also maybe based on the different application. So they have the different design and the AMR. Usually AMR set, uh, come in the in-house uh, environment. Uh, you, um, AMR will use the LiDAR to, uh, as a localization and the navigation uh, sensors. So, uh, most of the AMR can achieve a better, uh, a good performance for localization and navigation uh, performance in the uh, indoor environment. So I think um, um, for the choose of AMR based, I, I think there are uh, some other uh, factors we need to consider, such as the payload of the AMR and the detailed applications. Um, if it, if it is wrong on the uh, on a same um, same floor. I think most of uh, AMR can can achieve uh, autonomous navigation. However, uh, since AMR has different applications, such as maybe uh, they need to lift uh, different uh, kind of object. So I think the choose for AMR based, um, mostly will depend on the detail applications. Okay. okay, next question, AMR seems to be coming there hyper trend. What is the advantages of AGV over AMR? Uh, AGV, um, for the AGV, we don't need to consider uh, consider the environment change. Since we have uh, predefined the path for the AGV, the AGV will only under, uh, and, uh, only follow, uh, following the pre this predefined path. Once if the past will not be influenced by the environment, the ATV can still work. While the, for AMR, um, we are, uh, and its localization and navigation based on its uh, uh, surrounding environment. If, uh, if the environment uh, uh, is dynamic, such as in a warehouse, uh, sometimes it will be empty, while sometimes the, 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 the warehouse will be full. So, um, uh, so in this case, it will bring great influence on the AMR. 
However, the advantage for HGV is, uh, is that uh, uh, the influence from the, uh, from the um, dynamic environment. Well, um, for AMR, we don't need to come um, uh, pave some, such as some markers or uh, mag uh, mag uh, magnetic uh, tips uh, on, the on the floor. So the maintenance work for AMR also will be reduced. Okay, thanks. Uh, any other comments? Uh, yeah, so uh, the same same view, yeah. So with AGV, uh, I think if, if, if the requirement is that you don't need to have a keep changing environment, right? And you want something simple and then the path is always the same, then you can always consider AGV. It's not that, no, just because of the trend, then you must switch from the AGV to the AMR. If an application doesn't require the dynamic uh, capabilities of this AMR, then uh, AGV is still, is still, I mean, it's still a possible solution. And I think it's now also much cheaper than your AMR because AMR will, will have quite a few uh, expensive uh, sensors like your lighters and such. Yeah, so, so the, as, a, as an end user, you have to weigh the, the, the cost versus whether is it a suitable solution for your application. Yeah, so I think next one is my question also. Uh, so that one is on the custom view and its uh, components are IP67 rating or such. Okay, just to briefly uh, mention our, what we are providing is actually the, the nominal design the, the, for this uh, mobile robot. So we do have covers to cover all the, the moving parts and also the moving gears actually encased in the housing itself. So to, to move towards a certain rating or such, right, we will have to work together with uh, the company and user to make the system compliant with uh, certain standards that they, they need us to do. Uh. So typically what happens is that uh, for uh, end user, let's say if the end user is a product owner, they want to produce their own robot design, come up with their own robot uh, sort of solution to, to, to sell to others. Then we can work closer with them to come up with a range of products that meet different specs. So let's say I, I want to come up with a range of robots that is to deal with clean room, then we'll do everything that's clean room compliant. Then I want to come up with one that is uh, compliant with uh, maybe the food industry, then you choose the wheels and also make sure that the, 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 the ceiling and everything is actually compliant with the food industry. So what, what, what you are providing as, as a solution is the sort of the bare version of it. And then uh, it can be customized to fit the different industries. So in the case, let's say you want to do it in the CNC machine, you have to find out what sort of uh, mist environment uh, we are looking at and what sort of ceiling we need. And this can be incorporated into the design itself. Yeah, so I hope I answered that question. Robot custom view. I think the next one is also mine. Is the robot custom view and this computer? Oh, I only really mentioned earlier. SM, yes. I mean, the next one would be what is the typical setup and the yearly maintenance cost for four mobile vehicles? And it's a fleet system that cover an area of, for example, a football field in the CNC operation environment. Uh, uh, I think. Uh... This depends on the environment for the maintenance. If it's dusty, uh, the sensors might need to be checked frequently. And also it depends on the vendor and their suggested maintenance and policy. Uh, for example, uh, for, for, uh, wheel, uh, for wheel wear and the tier batteries, uh, so this also based on, uh, I think the detail applications, it's hard to see uh, um, there is a fixed um, maintenance cost for, for the um, uh, mobile robots. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Domin, any comments? Uh, yeah, I mean, it, it depends on, I think the, 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 the cost can vary quite a bit from different makers. Uh, so yeah, we don't, we don't, we don't actually buy, uh, for, for Syntex side, we don't actually buy the, the robots to use because we are in the, in the development of the robot itself. So uh, I don't have a very good view of uh, what is the off-the-shelf solutions for robots. Yeah, you, you only use that, but I never solve by them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, next question is there a safety standard? For yeah, this one, yeah, this one I think I can I can briefly answer. So uh, as in tech side, we have uh, colleagues who are involved in the development of this uh, standard in Singapore. So uh, if if there's a need to find out more, uh, you can always contact our colleague to give more information on this. I think it's still in the development stage or something like that. I'm not sure whether has it been finalized or not. Yeah, so that one I have to check with the colleague. Okay, sure. 
Okay, next, uh, probably the last question is the fleet management system shown by Simtech ARTC open source. Where okay. can I find more information for this uh, fleet management system? Okay, uh, maybe I can answer first. So mm -hmm. for ours, right, if it's the Windows based platform, it's a proprietary software. So uh, the, the, the reason is because so that uh, companies can use it as a means to license the, the product. So uh, that's why for the Windows side, it's actually not uh, open source. But for the Linux side, we are using leveraging on open source software to do our development. So uh, I think this one, maybe ARTC side may have more information on this also. Uh, Ming Yang, do you have anything to add? Uh, currently, the system is development uh, based on the raw system. The system uh, definitely is open source, but uh, the development uh, uh, source code uh, cannot uh, cannot oh. open right now <laughs> since this is a, a cooperation object uh, a project with our members. So, um, cannot cannot uh, open source. Okay. Okay. Hi everyone. Thank you. If you still have any questions, you can write to us. We'll be call you or email to you for the, for the whatever uh, answers potentially. Okay. Thank you again for attending this uh, this uh, this uh, webinar. Okay, we will follow up with you if you have. I mean, based on your uh, your your interest, whatever. Okay, okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay, for attending this webinar. Thank okay, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.